We are in <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Hear God's word. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. That's the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Oh, Lord, I trust that you would lift up your voice through this vessel for the glory of Christ and for the edification of your church. We pray in his holy name. Amen. Well, waiting patiently does not come easily for most of us. It's not a natural virtue. Waiting for the test results of a biopsy, waiting for a grade on a final exam, waiting for news of a missing child, waiting for a call from a job interview, waiting for a serious illness to pass, waiting, waiting, waiting. Add to that naysayers who will fill you with doubts about your expectations, prepare you for the worst, perhaps, or they're just plain old negative Nellies, they're pessimistic, shredding your hopes of optimism that you might have. And that's what Peter's audience is up against. The context here is verse 10, and that's the, uh, uh, Peter's audience here is hearing about the day of the Lord. It's the same as the day of visitation, verse 12, the day of judgment, verse, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 7. The day of visitation is 1 Peter 2, 12. The coming of God, 2 Peter 3, 12, in other places also known as the day of Christ. It's the parousia that Pastor Luke talked about last week, the second coming of Christ. And the phrase, the day of the Lord, is often used in the Old Testament to speak of God's judgment, God's judgment against the nations or against Israel. But they generally pointed to that great and terrible day of the Lord as precursors. And the prophets predicted the day of the Lord, the final day. And the early church took these references to indicate the day in which the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings would bring eternal judgment upon the wicked and the ultimate salvation of his own people. And as you know, scoffers have been shaking up the church with doubt that there even was a second coming. Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. The implication is that the promise of the Lord has failed and there's no evidence that it will happen and anyone putting their trust and hopes in such a thing, such a promise, are deluded. This is the serpent speaking from the garden, casting doubt on God's word. Has God said... And these pseudo-teachers are typical of people who reject the truth. They live antinomian lifestyles filled with arrogance and lust and greed. They follow their own sinful desires. They reject the truth and they teach false doctrines. Verse 5 says they deliberately overlook the facts that contradict them. And so apprehensive, faithful believers need to be encouraged as the scoffers were shaking them up. And they had become impatient. Perhaps they were doubting and losing hope. Some may think the scoffers were right and they had been mistaken after all about the Lord's promise. Now with pastoral care, Peter begins to comfort the church. And our big idea this morning, as you've heard, is we must learn to patiently wait for the coming day of the Lord. And you have in your outline three hopeful reminders to comfort impatient doubters waiting for the day of the Lord. And the first of which is his promise takes its time. Verse 8. But do not look overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. He's called the scoffers ungodly, unholy, accursed children, profane agitators, bound for eternal destruction. And now by way of contrast, 
For the second time, he calls his church beloved, my dear friends. And he says, don't lose sight of this one fact, literally this one thing. It is something in particular. Don't miss it. And what is that one thing? God's perspective of time is vastly different from ours. Perception is not always reality. If you look down a set of railroad tracks, your perception tells you that those parallel lines ultimately meet. But the axiom in geometry is this, two parallel lines never meet. And so the scoffers are dis uh, discounting the promise of Jesus and they're pointing to this long delay as their argument. And Peter argues against them to his, to his readers that we must adopt God's perspective of time. The fulfillment of his promise takes time. Literally, the one single day in God's way of reckoning time might as well be a thousand years, and a thousand years might as well be one single day. And so what is he saying? He's quoting from Psalm 90, where God compares his eternality to the short lifespan of man. From everlasting to everlasting you are God, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. In other words, God does not have a lifespan. That's the context of Psalm 90. He's eternal, though he acts in time, and he is always right on time, which may seem to you like a very long time. But God does not look at time the way you or I do. Though he functions in time, he doesn't think in terms of succession of time. As one has said, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? A single day is a thousand years, and a thousand years like a single day. Or as another, what seems like long ages to us is a mere blip in time to him. Now over 30 years have passed since the resurrection. Scoffers are stirring the pot. Doubts and fears are now threatening the stability of their faith. And, and over 2,000 years later, here we are sitting Wondering perhaps the same thing, likewise may fail to understand God's perspective, perspective of time. But history has been marked by famines and earthquakes and pestilence and pandemics and wars and rumors of wars. Sin is rampant as it was in the days of Noah or Sodom and Gomorrah. Christians are tempted to join the scoffers and ask that question, where is the promise of his coming? How much more do we need this exhortation of hope today? We dare not fall into doubt and despair. In spite of the seemingly long de delay, the day of the Lord will come. His promise takes time according to his perspective of time. But a second hopeful reminder to comfort impatient doubters waiting for the day of the Lord is his promise allows for time. Verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Now he's spoken to their distorted perception of time. Now he refutes the claim that God is slow at all in fulfilling his promise. If God doesn't re reckon time as we do, then he is not slow in fulfilling his promise, as some were claiming. He's not late. The some who are doubting it, whether the scoffers or doubting Christians or others who were thinking about becoming Christians and now were being dissuaded, God is not slow, he's not late, he's not failed, but he has a compassionate purpose in this delay. And Peter had argued from the eternality of God, and now he argues from the character of God. He's a patient God. He's slow to anger. He's long-suffering by nature. And this truth was well attested by Peter's readers. The Old Testament was filled of God's patience, allowing time for sinners to repent before it's too late. And to be clear, perish here means eternal damnation. And repentance is the turning from sin and placing your faith in Jesus Christ alone to save you. A change necessary for eternal life rather than eternal damnation. But the question is often raised, who is it that God does not wish to perish and come to repentance? For whom does he patiently allow 
so much time. Some common views, the universalists believes that God's will is that all mankind will ultimately be reconciled to God. And some even more radical universalists believe the fallen angels, possibly even Satan, will be redeemed. But Peter has already said the fallen angels are reserved in hell, waiting judgment. And John says Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire and tormented day and night forever and ever. Noah's flood destroyed all but eight, and Sodom and Gomorrah went up in smoke with only a few rescued. And so the Bible is clear. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Matthew 7. And so then there is what we would call the Arminian view. Jesus died for you and has a wonderful plan for your life. God wills all mankind to be saved without exception. The only thing that stands between God's will and a person's salvation is their free will decision. God has voted for you, the devil has voted against you, and you must cast the deciding vote. It goes something like that. One comment, uh, commentator who I have no reason to believe is an Arminian still made this claim. It is clear that according to 2 Peter, If God had his way, no one would come under condemnation in that judgment. He goes on to say, God's will may not be done, but it will not be for a lack of trying on his part. Now, you can hold this view and be a Christian, but I don't think that's what Peter means either. A third view, a more orthodox view, is God has two wills, a will of desire and a will of decree. His desired will is that all are saved. His will of decree is that only the elect chosen before time will come to faith. A parent desires their children to obey, but the decree is a paddle on the backside if they don't. Desire and decree are two different things. And it's interesting, the same Arminian proof texts are quoted, but with a reformed interpretation. Besides 2 Peter 3, 9, Ezekiel 18, 32, for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God, so turn and live. 2 Timothy 2, 4, who desires all people to come to the knowledge of the truth. One has explained this view, God has not ordained that all will be saved since many will perish forever. Still, God genuinely desires in one sense that all will be saved, even if he has not ultimately decreed that all will be saved. This is the very common view among very highly respected interpreters who also believe in the doctrine of election. It's certainly within the realm of orthodoxy. It's true God has a benevolence towards all mankind. He makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain to the just and to the unjust. But is this what Peter is trying to convey? There is another perspective, another view, and one I believe fits well with the text, and that's God's delay is for the purpose of gathering his elect. If you would, read the text with me as I emphasize a few things. If you would look at verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. We ask, who is the you? Verse 8 says, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved. And so the you is the beloved in this text. But it, it goes on to say, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish. We ask the question, what is the antecedent to any? I see it as any of you. Not willing that any of you should perish, but for all And again, I believe it's all of you to come to repentance. In other words, God does not purpose or intend any of his beloved elect to perish. His delay is such that he patiently waits for all of his chosen ones to repent and come to faith in the Lord Jesus. Peter's just been excoriating the scoffers in the entirety of chapter 2. They're bringing upon themselves swift destruction he argues that if God did not spare the angels, but are in cha- they are in chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, 
And if he says he did not spare the ancient world in Noah's day except for eight, and since he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. They will be destroyed, he says. They are accursed children. Their last state has become worse for them than the first. Verse 7 of chapter 3, the heavens and earth are being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. From all of that and more, he then turns with words of comfort to his beloved church, verse 8. And it seems strange to all of a sudden insert a desire for all mankind, including these scoffers, to come to repentance and not perish. The context seems reserved for God's chosen ones. Note further in verses 14 and 15. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. For who? You, the beloved, who are waiting. I believe that's implied. You count it patience of our Lord, count the patience of our Lord as salvation. And so I believe our text is addressing the fact that God is delaying his second coming while all of the sheep are safely gathered into the fold. From their election before time to their glorification after time as we know it ends. As we know it as God's chosen people, he is gathering them in through the ages. John 6, 37 through 39, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. John 10, 15 and 16, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice, speaking of the future elect who will be saved, both Jew and Gentile. John 10, 25 through 28, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Acts 13, 48, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And I think this view was clearly understood by some in the first century church. Clement of Rome said, Seeing then that he desires all his beloved to be partakers of repentance, he confirmed it by an act of his almighty will. In the second century, uh, shepherd of Hermes, But the Lord, being long-suffering, wishes those who were called through his Son to be saved. And so God is withholding judgment According to this view, until every one of his chosen ones hear his voice and are safely gathered into the fold. And his promise takes its time. His promise allows for time. And a third helpful reminder for impatient doubters is his promise is right on time. Verse 10. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. This text indicates four things about the coming day of the Lord. The first thing we notice is it comes with certainty. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The verb will come is positioned first in the Greek text, and that's to give emphasis to the certainty with which that day will come. You can count on it. Scoffers may doubt it. Believers need to cling to it as their blessed hope. God has promised it will surely come and it will not be late. His promise will be right on time. But then we notice it comes unexpectedly. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And the thief metaphor is used by the Apostle Paul, by Jesus, by John, and indicates the day of the Lord is coming without prior notice. Burglars don't warn you. They don't call ahead before they break into your home. There's no charts. There are no schemes. 
to direct or detect the time of his coming. Jesus said in his humanity, he did not even know the day or the hour of his coming. It comes suddenly and it comes unexpectedly. It comes certainly. And we notice third of all, it comes cataclysmically. And when the hev- then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. Verse 7 says, But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Verses 12 and 13, Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Now there's a lot of speculation as to what all of this means, but suffice it to say it is a time or language of upheaval. The beginning of creation of the heavens and the earth came with a word, and it was all good. The end is a major disruption to the heavens and the earth. The word roar refers to a rushing sound of some sort, perhaps the loud sounds of a crackling fire. It could also refer to the loud roar of the Lord's voice. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth quake. One thing we know, it will be a terrible, terrible day of the Lord for those who are outside of Christ. But then we learn from verse 10, it comes with scrutiny. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Now, there are a lot of variants on that word that the ESV, I believe, rightly chose as exposed. Several textual variants on the text. Again, Clement in the first century, after describing the fiery cataclysmic uh, end of of the world, notes, And then the works of men, the secret and the public, will appear. This is Judgment Day, a day of discovery, a day of exposure, a day when the works of men will come before the scrutiny of the eye of an almighty sovereign God, a day in which he will judge all the earth. There will be no shield between the sovereign eye of God and the heart of sinners in that day. This will be the day of great exposure, like tearing off the bandage from a gaping, ugly wound, Every sin, every thought, every idle word will be exposed and the judge of the earth will have the last say. This text assumes that believers and unbelievers will be present at this same time, this great and terrible day of the Lord. It's the day of the sheep and the goats that are gathered, the wheat and the tares, the just and the unjust, the saved and the unsaved, those that are found by amazing grace and those who have rejected grace and are damned forever. And so my final words, first of all to unbelievers, if you are without Christ here today, some of this might have been a little complicated for you, it's a difficult text, but you might find yourselves in the category of the scoffers. You might think there's no hope for you Where am I in all of this? You must face that question. There is no doubt about it. But both Testaments confirm, in spite of what I said about my interpretation of verse 9, there is room at the cross for the worst of sinners. We heard uh, uh, on Sunday night about Manasseh, one of the most wicked kings in Judah, and he eventually repented and came to the Lord. We're familiar with the Apostle Paul. He was once Saul of Tarsus while wreaking havoc on the church, was arrested on the Damascus Road. Lord, what would you have me to do? He repented and he became the great Apostle Paul. He called upon the name of the Lord and all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It is never too late this side of eternity this side of the day of the Lord, this side of the day of judgment. You must settle the matter in this life once and for all. You must ask yourself, am I a Christian? Are you still on the wrong side of the gospel? When the judgment day comes, will you hear, well done, good and faithful servant, or will you hear, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness? 
His promise is coming. Count on it. Will you be ready? Again, I say, you must face the question. To believers, almost every end time day of the Lord judgment text exhorts the believers in a similar way. Listen to Peter. Be holy, verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Verse 14, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Be holy, be expectant, verse 12, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Verse 13, we are waiting for the new heavens and a new earth. Again, be careful, verse 17, take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Guard your doctrine. Make sure you know the truth. Be not carried about by every wind of doctrine and flimsy teaching of the day. Be careful. And then be growing, verse 18, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That means you attend to his word faithfully. You diligently seek accountability. You are endeavoring to do all that you can to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord. And then be hopeful, verse 13. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Aren't those precious words? In which righteousness dwells. This corrupt world will be no more. The sin which so easily besets us will be forever mortified. Every tear will be wiped away from our eyes will bask in the presence of the Lord Jesus forever, where the Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land, a day of righteousness, a day of perfection, a day of glory, a day where the Lamb shines brightly in Emmanuel's land. But meanwhile, we should appreciate all the times he comes to us in the Lord's day worship. He visits us On this day, the Lord's day, he visits us. He comes to us in the preaching. He comes to us in celebrating baptisms. He comes to us in the Lord's table where we are refreshed and remember him until he come. Until then, we say with Peter, to him be the glory, both now and today, to the day of eternity. Blessed be his holy name. Our Father and our God, we wrestle with the texts, but we know one thing for sure. You are a glorious God who saves sinners. And this delay allows time to gather sinners into the fold safely. I trust that there is no one in this room that will leave today without knowing, without a doubt, that they have repented and that they have put their trust in the faithful Lord Jesus Christ. And for us who are believers, I pray that we might rejoice that you have visited us even today in this hour through the feeble preaching of this vessel, through the worship, through the singing, through the baptism, through the Lord's table. In so many ways, we thank you, Lord, for coming to us. But we do cry still, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen.